Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry, a John Carpenter fan cast. I am Alex, and joining me, as always, is my co-host, Noel. Hello. How are you doing today, Noel? Oh, rested. Good, good. Rested but sore. <laughs> are you ready for Halloween? Well, it feels like it's been 20 years now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we are here for Halloween H2O, mm -hmm. 20 years later. I remember the weird mocking that that got with the H2O, because this was back in the day where, let's put the number seven in the middle of seven. Let's have mm -hmm. Scream 2 with the two in place of the E. That's the whole era of let's just mix up the numbers and words and stuff. With the Fast and Furious franchise, those days are still here. Yes. Well, I think Scream 4 did it too recently. Yeah. Scraform. <laughs> And then we had Fan Fortastic. Yep, we did. It's been an interesting era. It is, and it's always teased, except for the Fast and Furious franchise. They can seemingly do anything. Had you seen H2O before? Yeah, I saw it opening night in the theater. I'm trying to remember, it wasn't as memorable as when I saw Scream, which was my first rated R film, and I had to Ooh. sneak past two ID checks to get in, <laughs> and the girls in front of me were nabbed, and I got in just in the skin of my teeth. Halloween H2O, I believe I was... This was in 98? Yes, this was in 1998. I would have been of age to get in there, so there wouldn't be any brave sneaking in. But I remember going, being very excited, and enjoying the film. Yeah, and I also saw it. I don't think I saw it opening night, but I did see it in theaters. It was interesting where I had that period. For the longest time, I hated horror movies because I was always just freaked out by the violence and the gore and getting scared mm. and all that stuff. But I had that period in the mid-90s where I started to learn how movies got made. Mm. And so it became less scary for me. But then I started to appreciate how filmmakers can manipulate emotion. Mm -hmm. So I actually really got into horror movies and slasher movies and, of course, Michael Myers and all that stuff. My dad was never a huge fan of slasher movies, but he really liked Scream because he thought it was just mm. a really clever, fun movie. And he had liked the first Halloween and had actually introduced me to the first Halloween. And since this was being advertised and a lot of the critics were even pointing out that this was kind of a throwback, this was a great callback and a nice recapturing of the original style, I actually talked my dad into going with me. Mm. And we went to a midnight showing, so it might have been opening night. It could have been, yeah. In a theater where we were the only two people. Amazing. And my dad cut his leg open halfway through the movie on a nail that was sticking out of the seat in front of him. Wow. That's crazy. So we missed a little bit of the movie as we went out to try to find someone there to see if he could get like a Band-Aid or something. It wasn't like terrible cut, but it was bleeding. Mm -hmm. And the only person in the theater was the projectionist and he was ignoring us. Amazing. Everyone had already locked that up and gone home. Wow. So my dad is just sitting there with napkins pressed to his leg. <laughs> Jeez. As we're watching the final track. And I think I went to see it again a couple weeks later by myself just to see the rest of the movie. It was not a very pleasant experience. My dad, he's never seen the film since, and I don't think he really liked it or disliked it either way. He just was such a miserable night for him. I bet, yeah. That sounds like an awful time. So, of course, I was seeing it with a parent. I'm trying to remember what my first R-rated movie was. I remember one time where I went to a movie theater, and my mom actually just came into the lobby to tell him, I'm giving him permission to see this. Yeah. Because <laughs> I was like 15, <laughs> and then it was fine. Yeah, I don't remember what my first R-rated movie was. I don't know. I just remember mine because it was so memorable. And I wasn't really big on horror films. I actually didn't even know what Scream was about when I went to see it. I went to see it with some co-workers. I didn't know what slashers really were. So I thought it was like a garden variety thriller, like a whodunit or something. And then I left the theater shaking <laughs> because it scared me so much. And again, I know I was already into the Halloween franchise. I don't know that I'd seen all of them. I know I'd seen the first two and I don't know which I hadn't hadn't in terms of four or five and six. I think I saw four mm. because I was already aware of the fact that they were kind of retconning. Right. But I don't know that I had seen five and six yet. I might have, I might not have. But I know I kept watching a bunch of them 
like I owned H2O on video when it came out, and I, mm. I watched it a bunch of times. But again, I haven't seen it since probably the early 2000s. Right. Because I remember Scream got me into Halloween. I went and saw the Halloween movies after that and loved them so much, so I was prepped by the time H2O came out. But I had seen, like, every slasher that was coming out. Like, you know, I, I know what you did last summer and stuff like that, because it was a very exciting time for slashers for a newbie like me. No, and we should actually mention that before we get into this, is between Halloween 6 and Halloween H2O, there was that sudden boom mm -hmm. with the release of Scream. Even though that was kind of a uh, meta-commentary satire of slasher films, it brought back with it this wave of new slasher films that kind of mixed with the stuff that CW was doing on TV, so it was the preppy teen, you know, everyone looks all clean and polished and about 10 yeah. years older than they should be. Summer Glen, California, that's where we are. I, I have the movie playing beside me. I'm just actually looking up here what were some of the other slasher films. Because, yeah, after Scream, you, of course, had Scream 2, I Know What You Did Last Summer, Urban Legend. Yeah. God, I remember Urban Legend. Yeah, a uh, majority of them were not good. I would say pretty much maybe two of them were good <laughs> out of all of them. Yeah. And then we just had that whole wave. And I think Halloween H2O still came early enough in that wave. If I went to see it in the theater, it was early enough. Because after I think of that, I was just like, whatever comes out, I'm just renting. Yeah, because I don't think people had quite gotten tired of it yet. So you had Scream and you had I Know What You Did Last Summer. And then there was Halloween H2O. Mm -hmm. And Urban Legend came out after that. That was when, yeah, the floodgates opened and it was just a bunch of stuff. In just a couple of months after this movie, that's when you had Urban Legend, I Still Know What You Did Last Summer. Mm-hmm. Scream 2 was in 97, so that had already come out too. Scream 3 was a few years later. Mm -hmm. This was right at the right moment of the slasher wave before it kind of overstayed its welcome. To try and reassert its dominance as the OG. Yeah. H2O was again executive produced by Mustafa Akkad and associate produced by his son Malik Akkad through their production company Troncus International, as well as Paul Freeman, who had been the onset producer on parts 4 and 6. Co-executive producing were Bob and Harvey Weinstein for their company Dimension Films, which is interesting because you don't usually see Bob and Harvey on screen as producers of Dimension Films because they had a number of other people who were producing that imprint for them, but they were like mm. personally involved in this movie. There you go. So Robert Zappia wrote for the film through multiple stages of development. After the failure of Part 6, his pitch was to go back to basics with a film set at a private prep school, kind of off in the countryside, where a student is picking off his classmates in a series of copycat killings only for the real Michael Myers to also show up. He did actually go far enough in development that a full draft of that script was written, and Adam Han Bird, who plays Charlie, the best friend of the Josh Hartnett character, mm -hmm. he was actually cast that early on in the process. He was originally cast as that copycat killer, huh. the teenager who's kind of obsessed with Michael Myers and is trying to follow in his suit. Zapia is primarily known as a television writer, having done episodes of Home Improvement, Thunder Alley, Teen Night Rider, the miniseries Five Days to Midnight, and the Tom and Jerry Show, as well as a segment producer on a couple of jackass movies. So doesn't really have much film writing experience, especially not horror writing experience. And I'll be honest, I've read one of his early drafts of this movie. It wasn't very good. It read about mm -hmm. on the same quality as that producer's cut of Halloween 6. Its heart is in the right place. It's just not good. With the 20th anniversary arriving, it was Jamie Lee Curtis herself who had the idea of bringing back Laurie Strode and exploring where a slasher film survivor would end up 20 years down the road. And this is when Kevin Williamson first entered the picture. And he'll make major contributions to the script despite only being credited as an executive producer. I'm not sure why he didn't want his name on the script at all. But, you know, this was Scream and Scream 2 had come out. I know what you did last summer had already come out. So Kevin Williamson was kind of at the height of his success. Dawson's Creek had already started, which was a series that he was the creator and head writer of. Have you ever watched Dawson's Creek? Oh, yeah. I watched Dawson's Creek. I think I saw every episode, actually. I never saw <laughs> Dawson's Creek. I was a big fan. Well, I know he only worked on the first two seasons and then other people took over. It went crazy after a while. But then, yeah, his other films that he's done, The Faculty, mm -hmm. Cursed, which had a very cursed production. Yes, it did. He also came back to Scream 4. He made his directorial debut with Teaching Mrs. Tingle. His big success has been in TV, though. I mean, not only Dawson's Creek, but he did Wasteland, Glory Days, Hidden Palms, Vampire Diaries. Oh, which is a huge success. Yes, that's been huge for him. And The Following and Stalker. All right. He still continues to have success to this day. He's kind of moved out of screenwriting, but his TV work has been successful. There you go. Williamson wrote a three-page treatment where he recycled elements of the original Zapia script, like some of the characters in the school setting, 
but centered the focus on Lori. And that's also where he brought in the elements of alcoholism. She has this whole speech in the movie of all the various treatment programs that she's been through and none of them work. Mm. That chunk of dialogue goes all the way back to this three-page treatment. Oh, wow. Zapia then continued on as a writer, turning that outline into a new draft. And this film just started cycling through script after script after script. Zapia wrote a bunch, and then Matt Greenberg wrote a bunch. Greenberg worked on the scripts for Grey Knight, The Prophecy 2, Reign of Fire, 1408, Mercy and Seventh Son, as well as the pilot for the 2000 TV series Invisible Man. I don't have a ton of other credits beyond Mimic, but Greenberg is a very prolific script doctor. He has tons of uncredited work throughout the industry. I just don't know what most of it is. I know he worked on Children of the Corn 3, <laughs> Urban Harvest. <laughs> <laughs> But the script just continued to be an issue. No one was fully happy with it. And that's when Kevin Williamson came back in and did a series of heavy rewrites. And almost all of the dialogue in the finished film is Kevin Williamson's. It has to be. If it wasn't, I would be shocked. It would be someone completely trying to copy or mimic the style of Kevin Williamson. There's even talking about like grammatical things. And I'm like, yep, that's him. <laughs> yep. It's very self-aware dialogue. Yes. Jamie Lee Curtis's big desire was to get John Carpenter and Deborah Hill involved with the project. Now, just to backtrack a bit, I remember in part six, we kind of brought up the fact that after Halloween 5, the rights lapsed to Halloween, mm -hmm. but they didn't go back to John Carpenter. And how in the recent year, the rights that Miramax had have lapsed and they didn't go back to John Carpenter. And I finally remembered why the rights will never go back to John Carpenter. He never created the project. He did it as work for hire. Oh. Halloween began life as an idea by producer Erwin Yablons for a project called The Babysitter Murders. And mm. that was a project that Deborah Hill and John Carpenter were hired to flesh out. And in fact, a number of the ideas that Carpenter used in the project, like the killer escaping from an asylum and being chased by his doctor, those came from a pitch that John had made earlier for a sequel to Black Christmas back when he was working with Bob Clark on Prey, which I've covered elsewhere. So yeah, Erwin Yablons was the originator of the concept for Halloween. And then he also had the idea while they were developing it to set it during Halloween and use the holiday and the title and all that stuff. Most of the script is John Carpenter, Deborah Hill's creation, but Erwin Yablons technically created Halloween. So anytime the rights lapse, they go back to Yablons and his estate. So they never owned the rights, period. And they are never going to own the rights. But that's probably why John was so eager to buy the rights. Okay, that makes sense. So now with Halloween H2O, John was interested in coming back, but only if they paid him something like 8 to $10 million. <laughs> because he thought that would fairly recompense him for the shares of profit he felt he had been left out on throughout the franchise over the years. That's a good thought. It's a good thought. The producers didn't go with it, so he walked. Yep. I know he did have a little bit of input on the script, but not very far in development. And Hill did actually stay involved with the project for a little bit longer, but then ultimately backed out too. Because there were already too many producers going on, and she just didn't want to wade into that mess, I'm guessing. For sure, yeah. So instead, Curtis turned to Steve Miner, with whom she had worked on Forever Young. And Miner has a history with the horror industry going back to the early 70s when he was the assistant editor on Last House on the Left. And he kept working as an editor and gradually as a producer for various other Sean S. Cunningham films. Because people forget that Sean S. Cunningham, the guy who did Friday the 13th, had directed throughout the 70s. Manny's Orphans, Here Come the Tigers, a whole bunch of other stuff. One of Miner's big steps was he was the associate producer of the first Friday the 13th, which led to him making his directorial debut with Friday the 13th parts 2 and 3. Hmm. And he continued on directing House, Soul Man, Warlock, Wild Hearts Can't Be Broken, Forever Young, My Father the Hero, Big Bully, Lake Placid, Texas Rangers, the remake of Day of the Dead. And starting with a run on Wonder Years, he's been a hugely prolific director and prominent director in television, which continues to this day. And he actually directed the pilots to Dawson's Creek and Wasteland <laughs> for Kevin Williamson. So Williamson was on board with him being on the picture, too. And they all figured, hey, he has some experience with slasher movies. Friday the 13th parts 2 and 3 were among the good ones. So that's how he got the gig. There you go. And that's about all I have for the production notes. I don't have a fully written synopsis, <laughs> so uh, let's just wing it a bit here. Sure. The film is set 20 years after the massacre of the original film. It retcons out parts 4, 5, and 6. They never happened. 
in some early drafts, they were thinking about making references to Jamie, mm-hmm. but they could never fully work out a justification for why Lori would have left her behind. Exactly. So technically, Michael Myers has not been seen for the last 20 years. Halloween is again approaching, and we again go back to Marion Crawford, who was the nurse with Dr. Loomis in parts one and two, as she finds that her house has been broken into, and all the files that were left behind by Dr. Loomis have been rifled through, especially one on Laurie Strode. And of course, she gets killed. Joseph Gordon-Levitt suddenly gets killed. That's right. And then we cut to a school out in the California countryside. It's a secluded, walled-in private prep school where Laurie Strode is now living under the assumed name of Carrie Tate because she faked her death, went into witness protection because her brother was never found. She's just constantly in a state of running and PTSD and alcoholism, and her life is a wreck. She works as a headmistress at the school. She shares a house on campus with her son, John. It's a very tense thing because he kind of wants to get out and be with his friends, and she constantly is clinging to him and smothering him and just wanting to keep him safe and not having to deal with any of this stuff. Meanwhile, he's taking care of her with her meds and her alcohol and everything like that. And she's built a relationship with a guidance counselor named Will. John has a girlfriend and friends. It's a nice campus, if a little white and preppy. Mm -hmm. Michael Myers makes his way to town, makes his way onto campus. And of course, it just happens to coincide with the majority of the students all leaving on a trip to Yosemite, except for a handful of students, including John and his girlfriend. And so then the massacre with Michael begins as he starts killing through what few people are still left behind. Lori is forced to confront him again. Her new love interest, Will, gets killed. Everyone just starts dying, and she manages to get her son and his girlfriend out and sends them down to call police. But she stays behind, leading to the final confrontation between Lori Strode and Michael Myers. Which ends and then leads to yet another, the final confrontation between Laurie Strode and Michael Myers. <laughs> I'll have some extra behind the scenes info on that ending, but why don't we just go ahead in and Alex, do you recommend Halloween H2O? I do. Very much. I enjoyed it very much. Obviously, it is a little underbaked. It copies a lot of the same beats from the Scream franchise and from that slasher template that was kind of introduced in 96 or 97 or where it was, including the uh, fake-out opening just out of view of the cops of the uh, first victim. It's largely bloodless. Like, it's got some pretty nasty kills, but I'd say it's probably on the lower end of the kill spectrum in terms of Halloween films. It's very slight, but I really enjoyed it because because of that. I like that it was lean and mean. I like that the focus was on Lori instead of the teens, because I could not be interested in the teens at all. And <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis just knocks it out of the park. She's great in this. Her final confrontation is Michael is great in this. And it would be a wonderful place to just leave the franchise forever. And I agree. I think it is impressive how nuanced the film is, how rich and thought out the film is, how deep the character study is of Laurie's character. I think the horror scenes and suspense work great for the most part. I think, yeah, the weak part is the teens. The teens just aren't really that interesting. But there's such a small part of things with so much of the focus on Lori that it's still just a fascinating character study of a slasher movie. And it's also just a very effective slasher movie. And I thought, yes, absolutely, this would have been the perfect way and the perfect place to end this franchise. Alas, <laughs> which we'll get into next time. <laughs> yes. Let's just go ahead and start with Jamie Lee Curtis. Wonderful performance. I don't even need Michael Myers to show up in this. I'd love to see just the effects of mm-hmm. like a woman dealing with the events of Halloween 20 years later and thinking Michael's going to show up in like Wes Craven's New Nightmare, where it's just in her mind for most of the film. It's almost scarier in that sense. I think that she does not phone it in even remotely. She is committed. She is focused. Her character arc is great. I wouldn't change a thing about her. What I love about those bits where she's seeing the specter of Michael Myers, Mm -hmm. she's not even like freaking out about them, like suddenly whipping around and seeing that there's no one there. It's like she's so used to it by now. Yeah, that she's almost weary. And yet it's almost crushing and weary to her that she just can't stop seeing this specter over her shoulder and reflections and all that stuff. And so you have that one moment where she actually does see him and is just start being like, okay, let's just make the illusion go away. Wait, the illusion's not going away. Go away, illusion. Why aren't you going away? (laughs) 
Yeah, I just wish they'd played it up more because sometimes it was too much. Well, not too much, but like chugging vodka and everything. But sometimes I'm like, why are you even out on Halloween? You are perfectly within your rights to just take a Xanax and have a (laughs) bath and not go out of the house on Halloween night. After what she went through over the course of two nights, and I'd like to discuss that more because I don't even know if Halloween 2 exists in this world. I think it's only like Halloween 1 and this that exist. John has that one line where you watched him burn. Oh, did he? Okay. Then how was Loomis still alive? Loomis exploded. Well, now that's a question. Did Loomis continue living beyond part two or was part two where Loomis died? I guess it could go either way because the photo was from the past. Yeah. But they did say that she was living with her, which he wasn't in those two movies. So I believe that he lived throughout it. I don't know. I think they were cherry picking what they wanted and I'm okay with that. That's fine. Well, I'm guessing maybe he was just left severely maimed by the fire and she was just taking care of him. Yeah, that could be the case. Because I don't imagine that she would just dedicate an entire office to files from her boss from 20 years ago. Yeah, that would be a little crazy. Those would be in a storage facility. (laughs) But if he had been kind of living there badly burned and it recently passed away and it's his house that she just mm-hmm. kind of lives into that's what i like is they don't really need to give us answers on that question no 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 and i understand why they did it because you want to connect to the first film and then kill off a familiar character and i'm okay with that i mean we could have had tommy doyle come back <laughs> <laughs> if it was paul rudd i'd be okay with that then i don't know if you realize that was a voice actor imitating donald pleasance i saw it at the end credits because it did sound off because i'm like why doesn't he sound so manic it's like a very sedate delivery of those speeches because he's like yeah. really animated in the movies And then I saw that, I'm like, wow, that's weird. (laughs) Yeah, they get in that of the documentary where they had that original speech from the first film, but it had already been mixed in with all the background noise. Oh, yeah. So they didn't have a clean track on it. So they'd have, like, the weird sound effects of, like, wow! when Michael jumps over the car and stuff. But anyways, yeah, going back to Jamie Lee Curtis, what was interesting about seeing the development of this by reading some of the early drafts is Kevin Williamson really brought in the whole alcoholism element. Mm -hmm. And then Zapia tried to wiggle away from that, that she's a recovering alcoholic. Mm. And then Jamie Lee Curtis apparently was like, no, I want her to still be a full on, she's got booze hidden around the house. Mm -hmm. You know, that whole scene where she asked the waiter for another Cabernet while she still has a full Cabernet. (laughs) She's just downing it, but trying to make it look like she only had the one so that Will won't know, hiding it behind his back. Mm -hmm. Just that whole scene where John, after she has the nightmare, goes to the medicine cabinet that's just full of bottles of pills. (laughs) And even he's like, okay, which one's the nightmares? There's the nightmare. (laughs) But I think you hit the nail on the head just with the one word of interesting. It's the first time I've been interested in a character since the first film. I want to know more about Laurie Strode in this. It's cool. I mean, she's a wreck, but she's a functional wreck. She's not like completely destroyed. She's damaged. She's someone who has been damaged by this incident, but is still, you know, she has a good job. Mm -hmm. She's functioning. She's functioning. She sounds like she's much better than John's father, who's the meth addict. (laughs) Yes. Which, who was that, I wonder? I guess maybe some random or something she met in like maybe a self-help program or something. And I know there's some fan theory that the father is the Lance Guest character from Halloween 2, but... But mm. even on the commentary, they're like, no, we figured that was probably just a relationship that didn't work out. And then yeah. because she was so damaged, she fell in with this guy who just took her down some dark paths to addictions. For sure, yeah. Anything could happen in 20 years. And then the relationship with John is interesting because, yeah, he does have that kind of annoying teen aspect of, I just want to be out on my own with my friends and all stuff. But it fits the fact that she is smothering him and that she doesn't take him seriously as being responsible, even though half the time he's taking care of her. Mm-hmm. And then I love the whole build of, you won't let me go anywhere. So she's like, okay, fine. I finally signed this piece so you can go somewhere. And he's like, oh crap, I already made plans to not go. <laughs> yeah, I want to go have sex with my girlfriend. That is more important than the Grand Canyon. But no, I like their back and forth. I like when they were shouting at each other in the street. I think they both did a great job. And I yeah. think they both brought an actual amount of emotion and motivation to these characters. And I, I really enjoyed it. I think if there's one thing that's missing is that we never get a final moment for them. No, yeah, it's true. Because we're so caught up in the moment. Yeah. I almost wish that there would been an extra beat between them before she hijacked the ambulance. I wish she had like just leaned over and been like, you're grounded. (laughs) I mean, they could have had that conversation and then she sees them loading Michael in 
into the ambulance. <laughs> and then that's when she goes out to do that. You know, some kind of a final bearing of the hatchet between them and understanding yeah. between them now. Uh, he should have been like, I get it, Mom. <laughs> you yeah. can drink as much as you like. I understand. I would like some alcohol as well, please. Well, and then that was an interesting other thing about the drafts. So initially, it was an all-girls school that he was the only boy at. Interesting. And that's why he feels out of place and a bit resentful. But then when they changed it, what happened was then it was going to be a school dance. There was going to be a Halloween school dance and there was going to be all chaos and all that stuff. It didn't work on the page. And what it was is that John didn't know about the past with Michael Myers. She had never told him. And so mm. he did a Halloween prank where he dressed up as Michael Myers. And that's what got him grounded from going to the dance. Oh, I see. I actually like that they brought him in. He knows the past. He knows what she's been through. Right. Instead of doing that whole thing of I'm keeping this a secret from you and him never knowing, he's been in on it and understands that to a degree, but she's still using her past, her baggage to restrict him from living his life. Yeah, that makes her more of a Sarah Connor than a just regular crazy person who's just like hiding him for no reason. And I even just love that bit where he's talking with Molly down in that basement room and he just openly lets fly of, oh yeah, we're related to a psychopathic killer. We kill people on Halloween. There's not like some moment where suddenly like it clicks for her of like, oh my God, you're related to my... She's just like, oh, that's interesting. And then the conversation just goes off somewhere else. Yeah, because no one would believe it. Yeah. Well, I think she believed it. She just didn't have any context for placing the history I mean, these kids aren't even 20. You know, the whole big uh, media scandal that would have happened 20 years ago would have been before they were born. Uh, based on her expression, I, I figured she was just thought he was joking. The way I got it was Michael Myers means nothing to these kids. Mm -hmm. Unless you're like one of those kids who's like obsessed with serial killers. Like how many kids nowadays, if you say Ed Gein, would instantly know who you're talking about? That's true. You know, unless you're a kid who's interested in that stuff, you know, especially the horror fans. <laughs> yeah. I just kind of like the relationship dynamics. And that's where I think the strength of Kevin Williams writing comes along because he's always really good at characters and relationships. Yes. That would be his bread and butter. So what do you think of Josh Hartnett as John? I can't get past that haircut anymore. I think whenever you make a choice like that in movies, you have to understand that you're probably dating your movie quite a bit. But I thought he brought a lot to it, actually. After I got past the uh, edgy, smoldering, I want to be Johnny Depp thing that he was doing <laughs> and everyone was doing in the 90s, Skeet all Rich and whatnot, he was fine. He brought some actual emotion to it. I was less interested when it was the teens on their own, but obviously that's not anyone's fault, really. I just don't care about teens anymore. I've seen it six times. But uh, yeah, I thought he was fine. And I agree too. And I think he's a fantastic actor that I'm glad that he did quickly rise in fame, even though I know he's kind of shied away from doing like big A-list roles anymore because he didn't really like that level of fame. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad to see that he has continued acting. And he. what's fascinating is he actually came and did interviews on the DVD. Did he? Nice. Good for him. Not Michelle Williams, but they got <laughs> <laughs> Michelle Williams is busy. She's off getting her Oscars. She's been like writing and producing and directing stuff too. So she's busy. She's great. She's very talented. But Josh Hartnett, this is his first film, but he had actually started working on Faculty first and was cast there. And they filmed Faculty and this simultaneously. Mm -hmm. It was because he caught the producer's eye on Faculty that they were like, we need someone who can stand toe to toe with Jamie Lee Curtis and play off this role. And that's where they offered it to him. And he does do that. He's very good acting with older actors who normally would outclass him. He does it a lot in the Faculty as well. And the hair was his thing. Yeah, I know. I remember <laughs> the bedhead look. <laughs> yeah, well, the hair was, that was a huge fight between him and the hair and makeup people on set. Oh, really? Where they kept trying to make it look nice, but he had this whole subversive thing of, you know, I'm sick and tired of making teenagers look too perfect and pretty. Yeah. And so what he would do was he had a little knit beanie cap that he would just spend the entire day wearing and right before they would start shooting, he would take it off and it wouldn't touch his hair at all. Julia says that, that he looks like he has hat hair. I thought it was supposed to be like... Like strategic bedhead look, but... Uh, and he did that intentionally to give himself that hat hair look. He did stand out. I will give him that. And there's even a bit where he actually went and snipped out a chunk of his bangs to make his bangs uneven. Yeah, he does it on the side of his head where he almost looks like he has like the Mo Three Stooges look a little bit. But I remember it really stood out in the faculty. Like, he really shines in the faculty. Well, in the faculty, it fits because he's kind of the grungier drug dealer kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guaranteed to jack you up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love the faculty. Faculty's great. You can see why he instantly caught people's attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. He's got that thing. And I almost want to say in a film that's kind of beneath that talent, but it's not because this is actually a much sharper film than you usually get with a slasher movie. No, it's true. For a sequel for part seven in a series. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But there was like a brief moment of prestige for slasher films, which although a lot of quote unquote true horror fans really disregard this 90s period, it really mm -hmm. brought a lot of new fans into the fold. 
Oh, and I forgot to add one other thing about director Steve Miner. Mm -hmm. The film that Jamie Lee Curtis shot before this, even though it came out later, was Virus. Oh, I remember Virus. Which she hated and was lobbying throughout the entire production to get the director fired. Oh, wow. And she was trying to get Steve Miner to be the one to come in and direct that. So she was already working with him to try to put together another project when this came around. The two of them were friends. Yeah, both of them do the commentary together. They're fun. I love Jamie Lee Curtis. I think she's a wonderful human being. How about Will, played by Adam Arkin, the teacher that she's having a relationship with? He was great. I thought he did a really good job. Like, it should have been a thankless role, but he brought a lot of charm and a lot of mm -hmm. warmth to the role and really interacted with her well. It looked like a believable relationship. Mm -hmm. I like that the character was very understanding of her. He was very, like, whatever she wanted, he would give her boundary and space and stuff, but he was clearly into her very much. He had his interests, but he also wanted to respect her issues. Yep. And he was funny, too, like that when she was telling him all these things and he's like, oh, that sucks. <laughs> oh, that's horrible. Take your shirt off. Yeah, pretty much. I love that in that moment where she's finally opening up to him, he doesn't quite click right away that that's what she's doing. He thinks it's a game. Yeah. And then just as it starts to sink into him that, oh... Oh, because he would know who Michael Myers is. It's true, yeah. But no, I thought he did a great job. I love that he's kind of almost being dragged around as the damsel in distress by the fully armed Laurie there in the climax. And then that mm. whole bit where he shoots who he thinks is Michael Myers, only for it to be L. Cool J. Yeah. Followed by him then suddenly getting straight up killed. Yeah, I was sad about that. That was a one-two dramatic punch. Yeah. This is a film that I like how, and the director really gets into this on the commentary, of how in order to play up tension, and this is something that's slasher films forget is you have to know which characters to not kill as much as you have to know which characters to kill like you have the whole scene with the woman and her daughter in the restroom where michael myers is stealing her car in most every other slasher film one or both of them would die she would probably be a single woman who would face michael myers in the restroom and get killed just that tension of now she has a daughter with her Michael just wants her keys. He's not interested in killing her, but just that whole drawn out tension of the scene. He just suddenly a hand reaches down and grabs her purse, then seeing him through the cracks. It was a really good scene. It was one of the better scenes from the entire franchise. I thought it was very scary just because of how normal it was. You're just going into a restroom, and then the fact that someone is in there, the door shuts. With your daughter right there with you, yeah. Yeah, which you can't get to her because you will have to open the door to get to her. It's a scene that doesn't really have any importance to the plot. Lot, but I think it really, really helped set the tension in the mood and also kind of psych you out in that, okay, he's not going to just straight up kill everyone. Mm -hmm. We also had that build with the LL Cool J scene where we'll get to LL Cool J in a second, but the scene with the guard, Ronnie is his name, where Michael just wants to get into the building and creates this whole scenario where he's psyching out Ronnie so he'll open up the gates and then sneak in, where again, in any other movie, that's where you would kill Ronnie. Yep. It's the return of stealth hunter Michael. Yes. He's been missed. By leaving Ronnie alive, you get that extra impact of the scene where Will thinks he kills Ronnie in the whole mm -hmm. almost throwback to Halloween 2 where people are just killing the wrong people by mistake because everyone's freaking out. I I like that that's a thread that's continuing. I like that there's that restraint in the storytelling. Because mm. again, in that early draft of the script, they killed everybody. They killed the guard. They killed everybody. Yeah. And that's what makes it scary because it's not formulaic. You don't know who is going to die rather than everyone's just like, hello, I am here. Now I am dead. And almost every draft, the Michelle Williams character died. Oh, really? There was no need for it because there's no impact from it. No, for sure. And it also knows how to, with the exception of the two teenagers, it also knows how to make us care about the people who are dying so their deaths have impact. Oh, I cared very much. I was mortified when that young woman died and how violently she died. It was very much out of Zodiac. Yeah, not so much the one guy, but the fact that she fought so much and then just to have basically her leg amputated. Yeah. She is so completely defenseless in that situation then. Yeah, it was really upsetting, but well done. And that Michael didn't do anything special. He just walked up, pinned her down, and stabbed. Yep. And then even, you know, yes, the two kids from the opening sequence are kind of loser kids. They steal the beer. They mess up the kitchen all that stuff. But even then, you know, a neighbor comes to them distressed. They're like, what's going on? Are you okay? Let's make mm -hmm. sure everything's safe. Let's call the police. I actually love that the nurse, even though she dies in that opening, was doing everything right. She's like, my house has been broken into. Fuck that. I'm not going in. Let's go to the neighbors. Call the police. Yeah. Even that second time when she goes into the house and suddenly Michael is kind of messing with her by opening doors. She's like, oh, fuck this. And just scrambles right 
right out of there, only to get to the other situation he set up at the house. In Scream, it introduced that people can fight back. Yes. And they're not stupid. They're not caricatures. They can run. Sometimes they run the wrong way because they're frightened, but they do things that you would do in that situation, and that makes it terrifying. And it can be more impactful to have someone still not survive even when they're doing the right thing. Because it's not scary that they didn't get away. It's scary that they almost got away. Mm Mm-hmm. I find the deaths were, even just the scenes of tension around the deaths, were so well executed. Mm -hmm. And even like in the whole final confrontation with Jamie, there's so many perfect sequences of tension where, I mean, like even that scene where the two kids are caught in the gate. Mm -hmm. They're scrambling to open up the gate and they get inside the gate, but they drop the keys. I got to try to get the keys. Oh no, I can't get the keys because Michael's here. Now we got to back up so he can't stab us because we're locked in. And now he's got the keys. <laughs> yep. And is trying to go through each key. It's like that's wonderful sequence of tension or the whole scene of Lori in the room with the tables. Oh, yeah. That was a good scene. You know, where she's kind of scrambling around the tables and then suddenly realizes, wait, I can't see his legs anymore. Where is he? He's on top of the table. <laughs> I think Miner has a very skilled hand. And I should also point out the editor. Patrick Lussier, Mm -hmm. he was a big, big editor at Dimension at the time. He edited Scream and Scream 2. He edited Mimic. He edited New Nightmare. He did a bunch of Wes Craven stuff and then has since become a director in his own right. Not always the best credits, but he uh, directed Dracula 2000, (laughs) My Bloody Valentine 3D, Oh yes, and Drive Angry 3D. Oh, dear. I don't think much of him as a director, but I actually think he was a very skilled editor, and I think the way this movie is cut is beautiful. It's not even 90 minutes. It's 89 minutes. I really appreciated its brevity, especially at 11 o'clock at night. And there's a lot of story in it. Yeah, no, it it packs in a lot for sure. And I think every slasher should be under an hour and a half. Yeah, and yet it doesn't feel too rushed. It doesn't feel too choppy. Everything is in there. It just there's no fat. There's like nothing I would trim out of it. I mean, even as I said, that whole scene with the restroom is completely unnecessary to the plot. But yet it feels so important to the pace and the atmosphere of the movie. Oh, yeah, for sure. You always have to have that establishing shot of Michael is coming. He's on his way. Well, let's talk about Michael, because there's been such a struggle to figure out the character of Michael. Yeah, it's true. And they don't really try in this one, so I like it. (laughs) Well, I think they do. And again, you know, that was one of the things that I actually liked about Five, as bad of a Mm -hmm. movie as Five was was they treated Michael like a character. He Mm -hmm. reacts to things. You see him putting together plans. You see that he actually has some thought and intelligence. And they also got someone who, while he's a tall man, is not like a huge bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. So he has a life. And I even heard him on the interviews where he said, I wanted to be like a panther. That is the best quality for Michael Myers because you can have that sudden shift between furious temperament and absolute stone patience, Mm -hmm. you know, waiting for the violence, but then when it happens, just exploding, you know, and the way he'll lock onto things, just the live movements and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I know Chris Durand, who is both an actor and a stuntman, he actually had played the Scream Killer in Scream 2 as well. Oh, nice. I think it was a really good instinct to, I mean, like even the bit where he's with the nurse in the house and suddenly the police car sirens go on and Michael's whipping around because suddenly he's like, I knew element has been introduced i need to plan around this Mm -hmm. he's thinking like even with the ll cool j scene or the scene in the bathroom it's like you can see him making plans and setting traps and luring people and that is such an important element of the character Mm -hmm. we never really get any like the first person pov shots no but there are these moments where the camera drifts in terms of like establishing shots where it's if someone was watching this is how it would look yeah POV shots were not in fashion at the time. There's a great physicality to the role, too, in terms of like the bit where she's in the hallway looking for Michael, and then he just lowers down from the ceiling. Yeah, like the xenomorph. And then, yeah, there's that scene where it's just the two of them face-to-face in the window of the door. Yeah, he's not as much of a Terminator in this, but he is precise. I do like that when he's trying to cut them through the gate. It's very much objective, like he's got an objective. He wants to get them, yeah. And then he realizes the knife isn't going to reach, so let's pull back, rethink strategy, keys are on the ground. Let's find the key. There is a methodical quality to him. 
Yeah, and he's not whimsical, which is good, with the exception of the skate in the face. Well, he has, and that was another thing that they mentioned on the commentary, was you have to have a trickster quality to Michael. Mm. Because, again, that fits Halloween, the trick-or-treats and all that stuff. Of Michael will build those tableaus. You know, we do see a couple mm. in, in this film. Because he'll use his victims to psych out other victims, too. Mm. He'll kill someone, but then display their body in a way that he can then use as part of whatever lure he has planned for a next victim. I guess that's true. Watching it right after watching Silence of the Lambs, the way that the one victim is displayed as well is very similar. Mm. You know, like a diorama. <laughs> and then the mask. Are you pro Let's See Michael's Eyes or against Let's See Michael's Eyes? I was discussing this with Julia. She sat beside me and watched this, and um, oh, yeah. she was very pro. I was against it at first because the mask looked a bit too tight, very, like, tight against his face. But the more I thought about it, I'm okay with the eyes because the guy did a very expressionless eyes, and I thought that that was cool. But well, I remember that was always one of the more striking things about Halloween 2 was you would see his eyes where the eye sockets were open enough that you could see the eyes, but they still had a little distance from the face so that they would be in shadow at some times, depending on how the light hit, and then you would right. see the eye in others. Here, yeah, it was hugging his face so tight you almost always see the eyes. Yeah, but you don't see them in distance shot. I'm watching it right now. When he's in the distance, they're black, and that's cool. But when he gets closer, you see the eyes. Well, and that's where there are three different masks that they used throughout this movie. Oh. For the first three weeks of shooting, they had a mask made by K&B, and that's mm -hmm. a mask that you still see in a lot of the wide shots, not all of them, but in a lot of them. That one, it had smaller eye holes. And the thing is, the director wanted it to be such a blank, featureless face that it's almost just pure white. Oh, okay. They thought, though, that in close-ups, it looked too blank. It almost looked too clean and almost cartoony. So they scrapped that mask. And then for the opening sequence, where it's the going after the nurse, he's actually wearing the mask from Halloween 6. Oh, interesting. And then for the remainder of the shoot, they had a new mask made by Stan Winston. Oh. And then they went back and reshot a number of the close-ups. So almost any time you see a close-up, or even in scenes like where he's flipping around the tables and all that stuff, a lot of that's the Stan Winston mask. Wow, okay. And I thought it was interesting how, you know, the Michael Myers mask, it's amazing how many variants you can get on just a blank face. It's true. But I kind of liked how this one had the hair spiked up a little more, like a fright wig. Mm. The Halloween 6 one earlier on, it's a little matted down, kind of like it's always been in the past, but this one, it was just kind of all poofed out. Yeah, and he's got very pronounced lips a couple times. Yeah. What'd you think of the score? The score is great. Love the score. It was one of my favorite parts of the whole movie. It was a very good way to orchestrate the original theme. It was a little bombastic at times because mm -hmm. it doesn't really fit with the minimalism of the usual Halloween scores, but it was of the time and I really enjoyed it. And they put in like nice little nods. They brought in the Mr. Sandman song, which uh, Lori smirks at. And I'm just like, does she have a real relationship with that song? Or was that just on the credits? Well, I think just the imagery of that song would just be a little yeah. trigger for for sure. They brought in the psycho theme, which I had never noticed before, and I've seen this movie a couple times. Yeah, that bit where she's walking towards the car from Psycho. Yeah, with the purse and the clothes, Julia noticed all that as well. Yeah, they do just a little hint of it on the score, yeah. Yeah, that was really nice. Yeah, and what's interesting about the score is, the score was originally done by John Ottman. John Ottman is primarily Brian Singer's collaborator. Okay. Not just in terms of scores, but he's also Brian Singer's editor. Okay. Yeah, no, he's an interesting guy. He both composes films and edits films. He made his directorial debut with Urban Legend 2. Oh, okay. <laughs> Final Cut. Which I don't think I've actually seen. I think it's one of the few ones I haven't seen, and I've seen Valentine. The score that he did, what's fascinating is the Blu-ray will actually play, I think, 10 minutes of scenes where you get to see what some of the scenes looked like with the original score on them. Mm-hmm. It's a little too Danny Elfman. Mm. I mean, he does a great job orchestrating the score, but there's some times where he goes a little overboard and so you get like flutes and violins mm -hmm. and a xylophone and it just doesn't quite work. So they brought in Marco Beltrami, who did the scores for Scream and Scream 2, to kind of remix the Ottman score and redo chunks of it. So it's kind of like half and half. Half of this is John Ottman, half of this is Beltrami. And I think it still comes together really well in the end. I think so. It's actually one of my favorite versions of the main Halloween theme. Yeah, I like it. It gets a little woodwindy at times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I can see that. But not too bad. So about the final confrontation between Laurie and Michael mm -hmm. in the field pinned up by the van against the tree, what did you think of it? 
Perfect. Perfect way to end it. She brings him out. She knows what she's doing. She knows he's going to come back to life. She steals the body. She's trying to get him away from everyone so he doesn't do his usual come out and kill the ambulance drivers, go on to the sequel. <laughs> when he gets out, as she knows he will, she calmly launches him out of the van. Not so much controlled with the flipping down the hill, but she does manage to pin him. And uh, the ending is perfect as far as I'm concerned. And I don't think they need to make another film. And I don't consider anything else canon. I think the flipping down the hill was a bit much. I think when she knocked him out of the van, she should have just driven the van into a tree and pinned into the tree. Yeah, I guess it looks more interesting, maybe. We didn't need the whole rolling down the hill and her getting thrown from the vehicle, but still being able to walk. Because that's not very <laughs> controlled, yeah. And still having the axe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then they have their little touching moment, literally. But no, just that Lori knows full well that he's not going to just go down from how I seemingly killed him. Yeah. And then, yeah, that whole moment where he reaches out for her. It reminded me of that scene with Jamie in the theatrical cut of Halloween 6 where she reaches mm. out to him and he seems to reach out to her only to push her down on the machinery more. Yeah, yeah. You just know that if he did manage to get a hold of her hand, it's not going to end well. No, he's going to try to kill her again. And again, it's like her saying goodbye to this part of her life. I thought it was perfect, yeah. That is where they should have ended it. Yeah. What they do as the cheat for the part eight, which we'll discuss later, is now so ludicrous <laughs> watching this film. It's, it's impossible. Do you want me to make you even more angry? What's that? That ludicrous retcon they have for part eight is something they already had in place to make this. Interesting. What do you mean? There was a clause in Mustafa Akkad's contract that they can never kill Michael Myers. Oh. And the only way that he would allow them to kill him is if they didn't really kill him. I see. And so Kevin Williamson, in order to get this ending, had to come up with the whole retcon that we get in part eight, where Michael Myers switched places with an ambulance driver. But when did he do that? It's impossible. <laughs> He switched places with an ambulance driver. And in fact, at the end of the credits, there was originally supposed to be a bit of a person in a paramedic's jacket just walking away from the school. Oh, uh, of course. So he was supposed to switch places with the ambulance driver. The ambulance driver's mouth is covered with duct tape, so that's why he can't speak to her. Yeah. And because she kills him, she is going to be locked up in a sanitarium, and the opening of Halloween 8 would be Michael coming after Laurie in the sanitarium. And that was all stuff that Jamie Lee Curtis had to agree to. To make this. In order to make this ending. I see. As long as they allowed her to have it be perceived as an actual ending so that people could have this be their last Halloween if they wanted it to be. It is my last Halloween film. <laughs> I want it to be. So it is just the politics. Yeah. That even that stupid idea was already in place and something they had to agree to in order to have this ending happen in the first place. Damn you, continuity. Just have a copycat. <laughs> To go where they go with part eight, we'll get there because we are still going to cover that episode in a couple of months. It's true. But for the record, my Halloween collection consists of one, two, H2O. That is all. <laughs> and that's my personal preference is one, two, H2O, the trilogy. Yeah. And then maybe Halloween four is a side thing on its own. Halloween legends. Just for, and that's just because I like Daniel Harris. She did a great job. Anything else we want to add about Halloween H2O? I liked it, and it's nice that it held up. I didn't think it would. I haven't seen it in years, and it was really nice. And Jamie Lee Curtis is a wonderful person, and I wish her well in all future endeavors. I had no doubts that I would still enjoy it, but I didn't expect to enjoy it as much as I did and, and to find as much nuance in it as I did. This is exactly what I would like to see from non-overthinking of trying to explain everything. There's nice nods to the original closet where she's just like, no way, I'm not getting in there. Oh, yeah, that's where I love where she psychs out Michael by making him think that she went in a closet. Exactly. And then runs up and smashes him in the head with a fire extinguisher. <laughs> exactly. I like that she's proactive. I like that there's another shot where she's the one stalking with the axe. Yes. I even love bits where Michael's coming after her with a butcher's knife. So she goes into a kitchen and pulls out a drawer full of butcher's knives. Yep. And yet none of them are effective against him. It's happened right now. And then that whole bit where he gets the knife stuck in the drawer. I just love the performance of Michael, of just how he reacts to his knife is stuck in the door, of just like, get this fucking thing off of me, now I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and then even that bit where she kicks him in the nuts, and he just doesn't even react. He almost looks pissed at about it. <laughs> 
Yeah, we didn't get a Michael Myers got nards. I think there's so many little moments in this. And we also didn't really talk much about the best friends of John. We talked about the one girl's death, but what I kind of liked about them is that they're kind of like an unlikely couple. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, he's kind of the horn dog, but he's a little awkward nerdy kid, and she's kind of the really beautiful goth girl. Yeah, I think they were trying to make her as counterculture, but I'm like, that is a model. But I kind of like that they were oddball, and, and I also like seeing that kid, because I do you know where you've probably seen that kid before? Where's that? You see seen Jumanji, right? Oh, is he from Jumanji? Yeah, he was the young Robin Williams from that whole opening 20 minutes of Jumanji. Oh, nice. I love Jumanji. I can see why they cast him as kind of oddball copycat serial killer type, but mm-hmm. then that he played a character so against type. For sure. Whoever's doing set deck is doing a great job because the uh, goth girl's room, I have friends, that was their room. It yep. looked exactly like that. Maybe less Goo Goo Dolls posters, <laughs> but... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, and then Scream 2 playing. And oh, what's funny was they wanted to have a clip of a Michael Myers movie, the comedian Michael Myers movie, playing on TV. Oh. But he refused to allow them to because he thought that would be too much of a gimmick. Uh, I could see that, yeah. He was very charmed by that idea, but he just said it's probably not the best one. So they just show Scream in that way of everyone's just watching each other's films. Yeah. The guy playing Michael Myers is like, oh, yeah, by the way, they showed on TV the movie where I also played the killer. <laughs> And then LL Cool J as the guard. Yeah, he was great. I love the whole characteristic of he's a struggling romance novel writer. And I love his relationship with his wife. Yeah. Because she was just like honestly giving him feedback. And I even love that line of, oh, come back and read me more because I got to find out what line she falls for. And he goes, it was the same one you did. (laughs) Yeah, he was great, and I'm glad that he did not ultimately perish. You know, in some ways, he does have that token character feel, but he's still a character, and he still has a nice arc throughout, and that he gets to live in the end, and that we got this in Deep Blue Sea so close together. (laughs) It's true. It was prime LL. The ladies loved Cool James, and so did we all. Oh, and that's funny was the actress playing the voice of his wife on the phone. She was on set with him recording those lines live, so they were really just improvising a lot of that. That's amazing. This is the important thing that people who make slasher films don't get of, yes, you can have the deaths where it's that cathartic, yes, the asshole is getting their comeuppance. Mm -hmm. We kind of got into this in part six. How much more effective of a movie is it if you care about the people that the horrible things are happening to, and then the fact that that person has now been lost is actually lingering throughout the film and affects other people? That makes it a much more powerful and gripping statement of a movie. Mm -hmm. And I think the best slasher films are ones where it's less about, look at that awesome death as, oh no, that person died horribly. Yeah, for sure. Where you care. I want to see more slash movies like this. It would be nice. I don't know if it's going to happen, but it would be nice. And yeah, and there wasn't much. There were a few gore shots, but it wasn't like Michael Myers ripping off people's faces or twisting people's heads off like we had in the past. No, they were very much in the realm of what yeah. could actually happen. <laughs> yeah, and there were no sex scenes. There was no nudity. Granted, that was an interesting thing. Most of the 90s slasher movies didn't really have much sex or nudity. Yeah, I think because they were meta commentaries, I think once you start commenting on things, I don't think you should double down into like the objectification of women. I think you're making that conscious decision with no yeah. naivete to do that. And I think it was because they were also getting kind of name TV actors who didn't really want to do that because it might affect their career. Exactly. Yeah, there's people that they're not going to want to show their stuff. And I respect that. No, and it shows you can have a film that works without that. I mean, and also that central to this film is a romance and a struggle between middle-aged people. Yeah. The teenagers aren't the focus of this. It's a middle-aged woman in a relationship with a middle-aged man in a film that would typically be sold to teenagers. It's true. You still have all that with the teenagers, but that's not the main focus. And they're doing their thing over here. They're having the world's lamest Halloween party in a basement somewhere (laughs) with a million candles, a sign that says Happy Halloween, and they're eating wings. Yeah, nothing ultimately happened in that room. No. They walked out of that room to find their friends and then we never see that room again. Everyone's indicating that someone is going to have sex at one point, but no one seems to be doing it. Even when they're left alone, they're just kind of sitting on the couch together and I'm like, guys, you're teenagers. (laughs) I mean, I even love bits where like Molly and John are attacked. He gets stabbed in the leg, so she grabs a rock and punches Michael in the face with it. Yeah, it's a lot of, like, equal opportunity of fighting of Michael in this. Everyone kind of gets their chance to knock him around, which is great. And I love Jamie Lee Curtis never gets to use the gun because Will emptied it on the wrong person. Yeah, it's true. He was a nervous Nelly. But I even love his reactions as she's kind of suddenly realizing that Michael came back because it's John 17th, and she's flying around the house, and he's like, well, calm down, calm down. Whoa, you have a gun under your pillow? Calm down. <laughs> She's been ready. She's been ready for 20 years. Yeah. 
I'm very glad we finally got to watch this again. Yeah, for sure. You know, we're almost done with this series, and we're kind of in the the bit of the pits of Carpenter's career right now, and this has been a nice, refreshing revisit. Sadly, it wasn't by Carpenter, but still. No, but it was nice, respectful to Carpenter's original vision, I think. And the thing is, it's easy to say it would be interesting to see what this movie would have been like had Carpenter directed it. Yeah. But even just what I read, the script was in such a different place in those mm-hmm. early ones. And Kevin Williamson had not come in to do like the heavy rewrites and all stuff. So a Carpenter film would have been so different from this. Absolutely. He probably would have cleaned up the script himself, but it would have a completely different style of dialogue with the characters have come across as well. Yeah. What would he have done with the kills and all that stuff. Michael's being killed right now on screen. That is Michael. That is Michael. If that was anyone else, that would be absolutely ludicrous. It's garbage. Yeah. I mean, I know, yes, the film was made so that they're having their cake and they're eating it too. Yeah, I don't approve. I would rather just have the cake. Yeah, I love that she just looks down triumphantly. The end. I will spray it in sealant and display it forever. That is my cake. Don't eat it too. (laughs) Halloween H2O was produced on a budget of $17 million and was released on August 7th, 1998. I don't know why this one didn't come out in October. I know. Halloween H2O opened at number nine, sadly. So it came out right at the same time as The Parent Trap and Ever After, (laughs) which I remember those being pretty big. Mm -hmm. Its second week, H2O shot up to number two. Oh, wow. Obviously, it built up some word of mouth. Its first weekend, it only made like $7 million. Its second weekend, it made 23 Not bad. That's pretty good for a slasher movie. Yeah. It was back down to number six by the third week, and that's because How Stella Got Her Groove Back came out. Of course. As well as The Avengers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like what? The Steed and Mrs. Peel Avengers. Yeah, I remember now. In its fourth week, H2O is still on at number 12. That's when Blade came out. Oh, you're not going to beat Blade. And Dead Man on Campus. Uh, one of Julia's favorite movies. In its fifth week, H2O is still on the charts at number 15. That's pretty good. That's when 54 came out. I don't remember that one lasting very long. Studio 50. Yeah, that was a bomb. And in its sixth week, the Jean-Claude Van Damme movie Knock Off came out, hmm. and H2O no longer appears in the top 10. It ultimately made $55 million. That's pretty good. Against a $17 million budget. That's nothing to sneeze at. That's a really good release. So you can definitely see why they wanted to make another one. For sure. So what all did come out in October? Urban Legend came out in September of that year. October... There's not really that much in terms of horror movies. We had Bride of Chucky, (laughs) Apt Pupil. Oh, yeah. And Vampires finally came out. Vampires had already been playing in festivals and all that stuff by then, but that finally got its release on October 30th. Of that, the John Carpenter's Vampires? Yeah. Wow. So he got the Halloween release. Maybe they just didn't want to step over John Carpenter. Maybe. But guess what else came out in October that year? What's that? Ants. Amazing. A Night at the Roxbury. (laughs) What Dreams May Come. Oh, yeah. And Pleasantville. So, any final thoughts on Halloween H2O? Give it a watch, everybody. I recommend it. Oh, and then, so you said Julia watched it with you. So what were her thoughts on the film? She watched it in installments. She had uh, stuff to do, but she liked it. She liked it very much. She said basically a lot of what I said. She enjoyed that we were watching a middle-aged woman having a conversation with a middle-aged person, and her interactions with her son were very realistic, and she just appreciated that there's actual character in this movie. Well, that's good to hear, because I I figured if there was any Halloween Halloween sequel she would enjoy, it would probably be this one. I think this is the one she likes the most out of any of them. Because I know two just didn't come together for her at all. No, no. And I know part one just was like, what? (laughs) No, she enjoys part one on a certain level, but she's just, yeah. I know, but all the holes kind of leapt out at her because she wasn't as deep into it as we were. She is a question asker, as she should be. Rightfully so. That made for some great conversation. For sure. Anyway, so that leaves us off here. So next month, we will have Evie back. We are going to do Silent Predators. Oh, yeah. A 1999 TV movie based on a script he wrote in 1975 called Fangs. I think that's going to be the last of the TV movies based on old scripts by Carpenter. There you go. Someone needs to do Prey. Someone, please direct Prey. (laughs) See you then. Thank you for listening, everybody, to our wonderful podcast. And we look forward to seeing you again. You know what line I really loved? What's that? Everyone's entitled to one good scare, and she says, I've had more than my share. Yeah. (laughs) 
Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. I mean, my fanfic idea, because I was big into fanfic at the time this came out. I was a teenager. We all were. <sighs> my idea would be that would be how you would then bring back the characters in part six was you open up part eight with this scene. And as she cuts off his head, we cut to his point of view as he sees the final axe hit and his head rolls down. And then that point of view suddenly opens up in a new body huh. as this person wakes up in a room, starts looking around, sees a mask on the wall, puts it on, finds a knife in the kitchen, goes to their parents' room and is coming up to this bed with these two sleeping figures in it with a knife and suddenly gets struck from behind. We realize that the kid is one of the two kids from Halloween 6. The person who struck him from behind is the older kid who hit him with a baseball bat. And the two people in the bed were Tommy Doyle and the mom. Huh. Then we would carry on the thread of now this kid, who was the kid who was going to be sacrificed for the thorn, is now becoming the new Michael Myers. And you can maybe even bring Jamie Lee Curtis in as kind of the new Loomis of, I already put an end to this. I need to make sure it stays an end. Interesting. That was my idea for what you could have done with part eight. But it would involve bringing back everything from part six, which I know they didn't want to do. No, for sure.